This is a Renegade Media Network podcast. I've got an all new promo code for the Zipix Toothpick site over at zipixtoothpicks.com. You guys know I love these. I was the first podcast to have these guys advertise for them because I actually reached out to them. I already used the product. I might as well see if they want to be a sponsor and they agreed to. So that should tell you a lot about what good guys they are over at zipixtoothpicks.com. They are flavored nicotine toothpicks. Do you remember those cinnamon flavored toothpicks you would get when you were younger? This is like the adult version. They got nicotine in the toothpicks. They are quite good. And it's a cheap alternative to smoking, dipping, vaping. Guys, please quit vaping. It looks ridiculous. These toothpicks, however, do not. And you don't have to go outdoors or be awkward. You can stay in your office, you can stay in the bar, you can be in the plane, any of these places, you can have the toothpick. No one cares you got a toothpick in and you're getting that nicotine fix that you might crave. So zipixtoothpicks.com, promo code counterflow, promo code counterflow will get you 20% off of your order and you will love these. I promise you. Go check them out. You are now listening to the Counterflow Podcast, a place for dissonant voices and unapproved opinions. You get split in fucking half, but I call him the hologram graph. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash a sinus with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Here is your host and humble narrator, Buck Johnson. What's up, you guys? Welcome back once again to another episode of the Counterflow Podcast. I'm glad you guys are with me once again. Welcome to all the new listeners and, of course, to all of the longtime loyal listeners. Good to have you back. So I was moving a little slow this morning. Last night, I was on a live cast with the Lions of Liberty, Mark Clare, John Odermatt, and Brian McWilliams. They do this segment every month or so, and they call it Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor. Well, I certainly took them up on that offer. Good times to be had on the Lions of Liberty, and I believe it will be in podcast form probably by the time this show drops. I think it should be out. So if that's something you're interested in, hearing me get a little tipsy throughout the evening, we talk about a lot of uh, dramatic stuff. That is for sure. I'm not going to give any spoilers away, but if you're interested in hearing that, go check it out at the Lions of Liberty. See if they've got it released yet. Libertarians in living rooms drinking liquor. It was a really good time. Thank you, Mark, for having me on. Loved it. So another thing I have enjoyed for quite some time is the YouTube page that my guest is in charge of. His name, he goes by Charlemagne. Not Charlemagne the God, but Charlemagne, the neo-reactionary content producer. And his stuff is really, really good, really informative. What is neo-reactionary thought, you might ask? Maybe some of you don't ask because you already know. But the name Mencius Moldbug, does that ring a bell? A.K.A. Curtis Yarvin. Nick Land is well known in these circles. But neo-reactionary thought is really interesting to me because... You can learn a lot. See, my friend Matt at Real King Pilled is actually the one that first introduced me to some of this. And uh, Curtis Yarvin, of course, has been on Thaddeus Russell's show, Pete Quinones' show. And the guy's brilliant. He's fascinating. And reading his content is really, once you see it, you can't unsee it. You've been red-pilled, so to speak. So I do recommend it. And really, if you want to get kind of an introduction to neo-reactionary thought and, and a lot of the work from Minchus Moldbug. Charlemagne, my guest today, his YouTube page is phenomenal. So I highly recommend it. He's got a series on there called Mulling Over Moldbug. He breaks down many of the concepts that are taught by Minchus Moldbug. We're going to get into them on this show today, of course, as well. But yeah, it's these guys, they see politics, they see government, the structures of power, the cathedral, as it's often called, we will get into that explanation today as well, but they see it for how it actually is, not how we might want it to be, or not how the people in charge have told us it is, but how it actually is. And that's also where a writer like James Burnham, a great writer of the Machiavellians, that's where he comes in in a lot of ways. He's been an influence on this movement. So 
Hans Hermann Hoppe, the wonderful anarcho-capitalist, member of the Mises Institute. His book, Democracy, the God that Failed, is a lot of people's gateway drug into neo-reactionary thoughts. So I should waste your time no longer. I wanted to kind of give you that brief intro to kind of what we're going to be talking about on here. But I've got Charlemagne on. His YouTube page is amazing. The stuff I've learned from his videos, well, well produced videos, I should say, is uh, really invaluable. And I'm glad he's here on Counterflow. Charlemagne, welcome to the show, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. How about you? I'm good. I'm excited to do this. I, I have been listening and watching your videos on the YouTube page for about six months, I would say. And uh, I, in leading up to doing this interview with you, I was re-listening to several of them, and it, I just had all of these topics bouncing around in my head, things to ask you about. So speaking of the videos that you produce on there and put on, the, on your YouTube page, I guess we'll start with that, uh, talk about who you are and, and what you do on that page and kind of the purpose of why you do this, because I'm, I'm thankful that you do. Well, thanks. Um, as far as uh, who I am and why I do this, uh, I guess I'm just another guy who uh, got uh, excited by uh, President Trump's uh, candidacy sometime in 2016 and started getting interested in politics just because, uh, you know, I could see pretty crazy things starting to happen in the country. Um, and I sort of wanted answers to what was really going on. Um, and uh, just from, you know, hanging out in uh, Discord servers and various communities uh, during that time, I heard a few names dropped, you know, like Moldbug. Um, and eventually I started Googling these things on my own and looking into them. And, you know, after, uh, after finding uh, Moldbug's blog, Unqualified Reservations, reading the, reading the whole uh, open letter to open-minded progressives, uh, Formalist Manifesto, a couple of other things on there, I was like, you know, wow, these ideas are really interesting and fresh and they make a lot of sense to me. Uh, I want to go see what other people are uh, saying about them. Um, so, I, you know, I started Googling Dark Enlightenment and Neo Reaction and Moldbug on YouTube trying to find some videos and there just weren't any at all. Um, there was maybe one from, I think, Millennial Woes or something like that and maybe one other person. But all I really found were audiobooks of the blog. So I was like, well... I guess I will try making the videos on this because people need to know these ideas. And at the time, I was already making a few uh, political videos, but they weren't really coming from uh, some refined core ideology. I was kind of just putting out my thoughts. So I decided to, I guess, start start afresh uh, with Neo Reaction. So I basically would consider, you know, my first video on the cathedral like the proper start of the channel where my, my Neo Reactionary, I guess, uh, predilections started solidifying. And basically, they have informed uh, my entire worldview ever since. Well, let's start with some definitions, because neo-reactionary and some of the other things that we're going to discuss in this interview, they're becoming thrown around a lot more than they than they used to be, for sure. And some sometimes when that happens, uh, words and definitions can morph into things maybe they aren't supposed to. So we'll start with neo-reactionary. What what does that philosophy entail? What does it mean in, in, in the thought of neo-reactionary? What does that mean to you? So uh, a neo-reactionary really just means modern reactionary. And reactionary um, is different than conservative. The normal way of viewing political uh, points of view is either liberal and conservative, but that's very much framed in the democratic politics uh, of the last few hundred years, whereas a reactionary uh, sees more eternal truths in the nature of man. And a reactionary's primary aim is really to have secure, stable, and responsible government and uh, have it align with human nature and approach government from a realistic perspective and not a um, wish-fulfilling ideological perspective. So reactionaries really want to uh, uh, pour, perform a real political science, I guess, in terms of uh, how they approach government and analyze things as they really are and not how we wish they would be. And this very much separates us from conservatives because reactionaries aren't really interested in conservatism per se, in the sense that conservatism, conservatives in America want to preserve some particular conception of the American constitution or some former version of the American government as they see as an ideal. Um, reactionaries tend to see the um, American system as a whole, as a sort of um, 
degeneration from older forms of government, namely uh, monarchical ones that were conducted in a more orderly fashion rather than a revolutionary fashion. Um, so many reactionaries will also be monarchists, um, as is um, the King Neo reactionary Curtis Yarvin himself, um, actual name of the blogger Mencius Moldbug. And uh, what a modern monarchist really is, is uh, Moldbug would describe it as a neo cameralist which is basically to say that uh, you would have a CEO in charge of uh, some corporate body, namely the government. And that's really the most, uh, that's the way you would organize a system that would hold the people running things actually accountable. Because what reactionaries see is that the uh, modern system of government uh, really has no semblance of accountability in it. Uh, you know, the Congress and various other institutions of the elected or appointed U.S. government is supposed to be responsible and accountable to the people. Uh, but as a whole, it really isn't. And reactionaries would like to have an accountable government. And this model actually works very well for uh, corporations uh, of the non-governmental type. In fact, basically every corporation is a monarchy. Um, and due to the liberal education system of the last few centuries, monarchy has been debased and derided, and uh, Americans in particular are taught to fear it, even though we encounter monarchical power basically every day. You probably encounter it at your normal day job. Um, the CEO or the boss is simply in charge, and there's, there's no bureaucratic oligarchical system that uh, is preventing him ultimately from enacting any policy he wishes, where the U.S. government is like that. And, you know, we could say the U.S. government in this way is a very poorly run corporation, and we would like to model it after much more effectively run corporate bodies. So I think that's the the general neo-reactionary worldview. There's there's going to be people listening to this, I know, that hear, hear things like what you just said and think, well, how do I have any say in this? Because again, we're so steeped in quote unquote democracy here in, in the United States. And it, it, I think a lot of people fall back on, well, I might not like who's in charge now, or this person might have cheated or, uh, you know, et cetera. But I do have a say in who gets in here next. How, how would that work in a monarchy style government? Would, because they're going to say, well, I don't have any say, so this person that I don't like is going to run things. I don't want that. Ah, so this gets into the uh, voice exit dichotomy. So there's really two primary ways that you can change the uh, form of government that is affecting you, and that's either with voice, which uh, you might call voting, expressing an opinion in some formal or informal mechanism, or exit, which is simply to leave it. So again, I would point to um, modern corporations that we're all familiar with. Uh, if you have a problem with how the particular monarchy that you're employed is is run, uh, you can actually find another job. You can exit that corporation and get hired at one that uh, operates better suited to uh, however you think it ought to be, whatever conditions would make you more comfortable. So this is really um, the solution to that problem. Um, basically, the ideal neo-reaction to your neo-reactionary system is something called patchwork, whereas mm -hmm. essentially um, you can think of it almost like neo-feudalism, where you have uh, a very, very, very large conglom conglomeration of states. So in America, you know, we have 50 states right now. Think about every single county, um, just as an example of the U.S. Uh, being a sovereign territory. Now, obviously, it wouldn't literally come down to that. That's just how you should think of how the neo-reactionary sees the patchwork system. You basically have competition in good government, just like you have competition in, you know, good books, good movies, good mm. computers, good whatever in uh, the do domain of particular corporations. So you have incentives for the um, owners of these corporations that are governments to actually perform duties in the interest of the people um, in their domain. Otherwise, the people would simply leave. Um, so that's basically the, the mechanism that would hold the monarchies accountable is uh, you would exit the monarchy rather than try and uh, perform politics to influence it. Yeah, I believe Hans Hermann Hoppe said something along the lines of 10,000 Liechtensteins. Exactly. Would, would be very uh, preferable, certainly to what we have now. So let, who are some of the names that people should know within neo-reactionary? Uh, obviously, Mencius Moldbug seems to be the godfather of it, uh, also known as Curtis Yarvin. Uh, who else should we know? 
Nick Land is uh, a very important figure. He sort of comes from a different angle, a very uh, esoteric and more uh, formal philosophical angle. Uh, Nick Land was actually uh, an, an author writing while before Moldbug had even started blogging. So there's this uh, sort of split in neo-reactionaries where you tend to have more followers of Yarvin versus more followers of Land, who very much comes from the postmodern tradition. Um, so there's Nick Land. Um, he's actually on Twitter. You can follow him at uh, Outsideness. Um, it's quite a good Twitter account. Some of his older books, like Fanged Numina, are pretty difficult to get into. Um, but his famous blog um, is The Dark Enlightenment. So you can find that essay um, on the internet fairly easily. I would recommend reading The Dark Enlightenment. Um, there's also uh, a blogger by the name of Spandrel. Um, he runs a blog named Bloody Shovel. Um, he's known for a few ideas such as uh, biological Leninism, um, which sort of describes the descent into um, the modern iteration of cultural Marxism, basically. Stalin's uh, or Spandrel's bio-Leninism is, is basically a description of how cultural Marxism metastasizes and, and grows and gets us to where we are now. So that's very much worth reading. And, you know, at this point, there are, are a couple dozen uh, minor bloggers, such as myself, even, who are sort of continuing these ideas. Yeah, you've got a, a uh, you say minor blogger. What's your following on, on YouTube? It looks giant, if I believe. It's pretty decent at this point, I would say. It's, uh, I think, 16,000 subs. Okay. Um, if I want to keep growing that, I'm definitely going to have to put out another video in the next couple of weeks because mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I've been a little slow on that lately. Has, uh, but has, yeah. Has YouTube threatened to take you down? No, I've never received any threats from YouTube at all. I think that's uh, other than, you know, basic copyright claims and, and that sure. sort of things that just, just happened. I, I think this is, uh, some, this is something people have noticed. Um, Neo-reactionaries tend to not get targeted by YouTube because we tend to be careful, I think, in how we speak, but also because our, our ideas are explicitly framed such as to not actually threaten the power structure in any way. Uh, Neo-reactionaries, although we have these preferences that I mentioned earlier in terms of how the government ought to be run I, uh, in, in our model, uh, we're not advocating anything and we're not trying to uh, do crowd speak, um, as, as we say, which is to sort of instigate or try and convince others to do anything collectively. We're, our, what, the way neo-reactionaries view our role is simply to explain people how thing, explain to people how things really are how the government actually works or the entire you know, party regime apparatus. And that's really all we're here to do. Um, and this is a, a, a good strategy because uh, it prevents you from being viewed as a threat by the system. And we can get into this. Mm -hmm. um, the, the regime is constantly looking for threats to attack, which justify its own existence in their political formula. How important, if at all, I mean, it seems to me like there's been a, some influence here, was James Burnham for the for the uh, neo-reactionary thought? James Burnham is uh, actually critical. And I've really come to view people like uh, Yarvin as a gateway to some of these older thinkers um, who you know, are now deceased, but have written incredible works um, just in this century. James Burnham's uh, The Managerial Revolution and The Machiavellians are both key uh, books to read. You can find them in audiobook format as well. And you know, a lot of what the neo-reactionaries like Yarvin are actually doing is 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 sort of a recontextualizing ideas from Burnham and even older thinkers, because there is this this sort of perennialism in reactionary ideas, and Yarvin is basically just updating Burnham's insights into the modern frame because it's much easier to understand that way. And he also pulls from other backgrounds as well. Yarvin has a much has a uh, very libertarian background, which Burnham doesn't quite have so much. But uh, they they very much view um, power and government in this Machiavellian tradition. Mm -hmm. Which again, the Machiavellian tradition is basically the the tradition of political science and examining things how they really are and not how they formally are presented us uh, to us on paper. Like you know, the U.S. is presented as this three branch system that works this way you know, according to this document called the Constitution. But the Machiavellian cares about, you know, what is the actual reality of the modern regime? And it certainly has very little to do with the Constitution. Right. Do you find that conservatives and or maybe libertarians 
look at things like you're kind of saying how they should be uh, versus the reality? Do you, do you think conservatives and or libertarians have a problem understanding the true dynamics of political power and, and how it actually does work? I think libertarians, uh, the more serious ones, will say, not the uh, left libertarians or la la libertarians, as, as Hoppe says. Um, real libertarians have a, a very solid, sometimes even from Burnham, understanding of how the government actually works. Um, their their problem tends to be more organizational. I think conservatives have a problem with actually getting their frame of mind out of the sort of Overton bubble that keeps uh, any sort of right-wing political thought from actually um, doing anything outside of this virtualized environment. Basically, all politics is taking place in this, this sort of virtualized cage, and it can't really harm anything. And conservatives are really entirely in that cage. I think conservatives would 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 benefit greatly from reading people like Hans Hermann Hoppe or taking the Austrian school of libertarianism more seriously, because this, uh, to some extent, especially uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe's libertarianism, helps you get out of that liberal frame. You know, essentially conservatives are in the liberal frame, and that's really what's keeping them from from doing anything. And I, I think if if you were to try and um, you know, spread these sort of ideas to anyone. It would really be the conservatives you would want to start thinking this way because a lot of libertarians, you know, already do. I want to tell you guys about the official coffee of the Counterflow podcast, and that is Lorenzotti Coffee over at Lorenzotti.coffee. I don't really want to specifically tell you about them because I drink it every morning because I love it because it's directly imported from Italy. It's in these vacuum sealed packs. It's in these beautiful tins that look very good on your kitchen counter. Those aren't really the reasons I want to tell you about them. The real reason is because in this day and age with all of the insanity going on, I think it's nice to be able to have companies that are very like-minded that we can support. And that's very helpful. You know, everyone's scared now, like, should I support this company? I don't know. Are they crazy? Well, I can tell you, the guys at Lorenzotti.coffee are really good guys. They're like-minded individuals, and they want to support shows like mine that you listen to. So I think if they're willing to give me a cut of the money coming into them from you guys, that should uh, make you want to support them. You like this show? You want to support like-minded companies? Well, here's one for you, Lorenzotti Coffee over at L-O-R-E-N-Z-O-T-T-I dot coffee. I'll tell you one thing. If you type in promo code BUCK, B-U-C-K, at checkout, you will get 10% off of your order. You'll be supporting a very good company. The coffee is amazing, and it helps me out too. So if you like this show, give it some support. Now back to the show. What were your politics before you discovered Curtis Yarvin, Mitch Smallbug? Yeah, so I, I, I guess uh, I basically went through the progressive left training program that is the modern university. And, you know, I was, I was just a sort of basic default liberal, I think, as Andrew Breitbart put it, um, mm -hmm. sort of how everyone is. But I didn't really have any particularly strong convictions. It's just sort of the natural state of the, the modern person, really, right? Um, and what really broke things for me was I think in 2014 um, I was listening to Sam Harris talk about Islam a lot um, and then the Nice attacks happened and this was sort of this this trigger event that kind of snapped me out of it and made me realize that something was incredibly wrong with the story I've been told and then you know shortly after Trump comes along and just sort of blows up this whole thing, you know, by a factor of 10 or 100 and sort of everything just comes into view. It's in your face. And now you sort of have to engage. So basically over this two year period, I sort of went to from default liberal to a more um, classical liberal to conservative, you would say. Um, I was never alt right, um, uh, but I got fully on board with, uh, you know, Trump's movement, basically. And Shortly thereafter, I got right into neo reaction. So it was a pretty fast journey for me. Yeah, that um, is. I think it kind of is for most people who get into neo reaction because you know you read one essay from from Yarvin and he's just bombarding you with uh, you know red pills. It's just like an onslaught. Um, and so perhaps it's not for everyone, uh, but if you if you really take it seriously, which is really how you want to I think read you know most philosophical text is just put yourself in the frame of mind of the person reading it, take seriously everything they're talking about and, you know, then ingest it. 
Um, so if you if you approach ideas like this, um, you know, the, with the cliche and open mind, you can actually uh, make a lot of progress. You know, Yarvin's hard to read because you know one of the he starts out with sort of debunking the American Revolution, which mm-hmm. most people you know can't even uh, tolerate, right? But if you if you decide, I'll just I'll take this idea seriously and see what he has to say. Uh, you know, that's how you should approach this stuff. Yeah, I, I think it is. It's interesting to hear your journey because, it, like you said, it was quick. I've been in libertarian circles for 21 years now, and I think it is easier for Hoppe-style libertarians, uh, Rothbard-style libertarians, to open up to neo-reaction because Murray Rothbard was writing stuff about the American Revolution, uh, debunking the, the official story as well. Uh, Hans Hermann Hoppe, of course, in Democracy, the God That Failed, kind of leans in towards basically – letting us understand that monarchy is actually better than democracy. And so there is that path that I think is commonly traveled. It's interesting to hear basically kind of a default lefty boom into into neo reaction. I've not heard that one yet. Yeah, it's kind of bizarre. And, you know, some people will criticize for, you know, sort of changing your mind too quickly. But, uh, you know, in my view, there's, there's really nothing wrong with, uh, accepting truth if you if sure. you think you've encountered it, you know it doesn't yeah. really matter how fast it occurs. Is neo reaction uh, thought inherently right wing? Um, I think I I kind of have to say yes. Um, I don't really like viewing things in terms of in terms of right and left per se because that sort of is a way of of sticking yourself in the Overton bubble. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it would be kind of weaselly for me to say no. So I would say, yes, it's, it's right wing. Any, any any person would recognize it as a right wing way of thinking. Well, let's get some definitions there too, then how how would you define left wing and then right wing? Yeah. So I think most people would say left wing and right wing are basically liberal and conservative. I would say left wing and right wing are more like uh, the dichotomy between uh, utopianism and natural order, something like that. I think right wingers tend to be more interested in the natural order of things, and left wingers tend to be more interested in interested in utopianism or you know the unconstrained vision, as um, mm-hmm. your soul might put it. Yes. Why? How did alt right get associated with? And for my listeners from here on out, I'm I'm referring to neo reaction as NRX. So I, when I say NRX, that's just short for that. How did the term alt-right get associated with NRX? Yeah, that's sort of the job of those uh, those beloved journalists uh, at the New York Times and other places. Um, you know, basically, I've, I've actually looked uh, into this before. If you if you just Google neo-reaction, uh, Mencius Moldbug, or maybe it won't work anymore since uh, this stuff is a lot more popular. But if you did this back in 2015, you would find like, three to five articles sort of linking, you know, Bannon and Moldbug and the mm-hmm. alt-right together as they do, you know, so it's it's sort of a hit job. Um, Neo Reaction actually has very little to do with the alt-right, although many people in the alt-right when it existed um, certainly knew about Neo Reaction and some of them were even influenced by it. Um, I mentioned Millennial Woes earlier. He had a video on the Dark Enlightenment. Um, so it's something that people have been aware of, um, but I wouldn't say it's core to the alt-right in any sense. I mean, really, the the alt-right is an anathema to neo-reactionaries. Neo-reactionaries um, see the alt-right as it was, as basically doing all of the wrong things, mm-hmm. doing all of the things it possibly could to antagonize the regime and uh, get itself nuked, which is exactly what happened. Now, the, mm-hmm. the alt-right no longer exists because they they made a series of predictable errors. We got to talk about the cathedral. That's one of the first videos you mentioned that that you did once you kind of jumped into this space. So that's off. So I saw the the term cathedral used on Fox News a couple of times <laughs> recently, which is like okay, interesting. But again, when when words like the cathedral get uh, thrown about into a bigger audience, we'll say that they kind of morph sometimes into things that they aren't actually supposed to mean. So. Let's cover that term, the cathedral. What is it? Uh, when did it come about? And, and and what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, so this is very important. The, the cathedral is sort of the central idea 
um, in Mencius Mullerbug's original blogs. And I'm very happy to have this opportunity to do some gatekeeping because, as you said, this term is starting to get out there and get watered down and misunderstood. 100% the people on Fox, et cetera, throwing this word out, have virtually no idea what it means. Um, so what what is the cathedral? The cathedral is just a word for a system of ideological consensus making. It's a distributed system of ideological consensus making. There's no, there's no core, there's no center to it. Um, and what it really means in a nutshell is universities plus the media. Uh, and you can append a few other NGOs and things like that. We can say um, institutions of education and institutions of thought distribution. Um, so the universities, the professors at the universities sort of create the ideological fabric. Um, they do all of the thinking, all of the intellectualizing on what modern philosophy is supposed to be. And then the media distributes these ideas to uh, all of the masses and all of the elites and everyone in the country. And you know the weird, the weird question is, how do all of these universities and the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Guardian and all these these places, how do they all agree on everything all the time without some central body controlling them? Well, the answer to this is because they have a religion. Um, the religion is called progressivism, and it's descended, according to Moldbug, in a very literal sense from um, Calvinism and mm -hmm. Protestantism, mainline Protestantism generally. And we call it the cathedral sort of as a pun because the the ideological core of Western civilization uh, before was was the church. You know, in the Middle Ages uh, and before the Renaissance, even during the Renaissance, science, uh, philosophy, everything was done through the church. It was the core intellectual structure uh, of the Western world. So cathedral is sort of denoting that there remains this religious structure to the universities and the media. And even though they, they claim no particular religion, they nevertheless do have one. And the fact that they have this, this religion of uh, atheistic progressivism, it's a no God religion, right? It may be atheism, but it's still a religion. Um, Buddhism has no central God, for example. Um, so it is in fact a religion and that's how they coordinate so the cathedral is the fact that it is the fact that all of these different institutions, Harvard, Brown, Yale, the New York Times, they all converge into one effective unit in this distributed fashion. And it's difficult to notice this thing because it is oligarchical in nature. It's very easy to notice democratic power, which is, you know, masses of people engaging in some collective activity. It's very easy to notice monarchical power which is some important person in charge of things, uh, you know, sending out a directive. It's very difficult to notice oligarchical power because it, it's very good at camouflaging and hiding itself. Um, so that's what the cathedral is. It's sort of the intellectual core of the American oligarchy. It's how all of the politicians and CEOs and journalists um, merge their, their ideological apparatus into one unit. And this is sort of a natural phenomenon as well. It's not being directed by anyone. It's simply a product of the fact that uh, all of these people at the universities and media, they all believe the same thing. And because they believe the same thing, they produce ideas that are like each other and they mutually check each other, right? So, you know, let's say some journalist at the uh, at Harvard or sorry, at uh, the New York Times or a professor at Harvard, um, you know, goes out of line on something they say. Um, the, the other parts of the cathedral can, you know, cancel them. They can check them um, and retain its its um, religious canon, right? Just like the, the Pope could excommunicate someone who goes out of line. So there are mechanisms to, to keep this whole thing moving in one direction. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the sort of summation of the cathedral. And we can get into even more detail on it if you like. Yeah, because the, not only can they check themselves within that, that structure, uh, something I've learned from watching your videos is they can check the politicians because uh, I want you to talk now about the media controlled state. I find this uh, really intriguing. Yeah. So in the U.S. Constitution, we have these amendments that protect us. Uh, they give us freedoms of religion, uh, freedom of uh, freedom of religion and uh, freedom of the press. Right. So we understand what uh, freedom uh, we, when we understand what a uh, state controlled religion is. We understand what a 
a religion controlled state is that is a theocracy right so um you know the 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 church can control the state or the state can prescribe what religion you're supposed to be the state can also control the media so you can have a a press con- uh, state controlled press you know you have that in north korea you have that to some extent in the soviet union but what does a press controlled state look like that's a really weird idea can you think of what a press controlled state is and you know you can sort of feel in your brain um the cogs sort of jamming because you can't figure out what exactly this means there's no historical example that you can think of a press controlled state but in fact this is actually how the u.s um system works right now we live in a press controlled state um how do we know this we, well we can see that who, who are the most powerful people and the most unaccountable people in the entire country, it's the journalists at the New York Times. Um, it's not the political class. Um, the journalists at the New York Times can bully the political class mm-hmm. um, with absolutely no repercussions. They can bully uh, ultra wealthy capitalists with no repercussions. Um, so when you simply take a look at, you know, who can influence who and who is accountable to who, it's very clear that. Uh, you know, Congress is accountable to the New York Times and Harvard and Yale and not the other way around. Um, And that is because an oligarchy of uh, scientific government, uh, this is really set in motion by FDR, but the Mm -hmm. oligarchical bureaucracy of the the scientific regime that is led by professors and journalists, this this has supplanted uh, democracy. And so now the, the formal political apparatus of Congress, the president, and even the Supreme Court are just making ethical decisions based on what uh, the current iteration of progressivism says is correct. And they're entirely at the mercy of this ideolog- ideology. There's no way that the politicians can get elected and sort of take things in a new direction that are uh, an, an anathema to progressivism. So this is a really key insight um, of Moldbug and neo-reactionaries is that power in the United States doesn't rest in the formal governmental apparatus because that apparatus uh, may be actually putting uh, formally instantiating the laws. But where 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 are they accountable to? They are actually accountable to journalists because you know congressmen can be uh, potentially even removed from power. Uh, if a if the New York Times decides it should be mm-hmm. show, um, and uh, you know this is basically why the president President Trump was unable to get anything done uh, during his term in terms of really you know reversing this process. When you look at the outcome of Trump's presidency, you know you can point to some tangible things that you know we can say you might like like the wall for example. Like there was definitely some amount of wall built, right? But after four years of Trump, has anything actually really been been done to sort of to, to really shift the direction that the country is moving in? The answer is no, because the politicians do not actually have power in this country. It's, it's, the, it's the press that has the, the real power in, in tandem with the universities, because journalists don't come up with these uh, philosophical abstractions on their own, right? That's what the professors do. So there, there's this sort of a uh, mutual benefit here where the professors can come up with their ideas and then the media can propagate them and can and profit from the ideas basically and the and the professors basically get to become priests um through this relationship because ultimately everyone is looking to them uh for their you know religious doctrine basically i i hear a lot that all the mainstream media, the corporate press, it's all the same, no matter who, who we're talking about. And they will, I will, I've often pointed out that Tucker Carlson seems to be uh, a diamond in the rough for sure. And, and then I've had people come back at me with, no, he's controlled opposition. And then I see things like the New York times, you were talking about gatekeeping and, and how they can check uh, the, 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 the guy that gets out of line essentially within the cathedral uh, the New York Times tried to was going to publish Tucker Carlson's address, as I believe, if I'm correct on that. Uh, is he an example of someone fighting against this within it? What, what, what do you see Tucker as? Tucker is really curious. I've um, I've thought about him quite a bit, and it's rather difficult to figure him out. But um, 
you know, I think we, it's it's difficult to really say what his true motivations are. Uh, I think he's sort of a a reflection of what future rogue elites or dissatisfied elites might look like. But I think ultimately he still is trapped within the frame of the Overton bubble. And, you know, occasionally he sort of tries to poke at the edges. But, uh, you know, I think anyone who watches Tucker Carlson knows that there are certain subjects that he could talk about, but doesn't. You know, he never, he he generally knows how far you can actually push things. And you can talk to people like James O'Keefe and Project Veritas on occasion and not actually threaten the cathedral. I mean, all <laughs> all uh, Project Veritas really amounts to is just sort of empirical verification of what I'm saying right now. So, you know, Tucker Carlson simply pointing out that the media um, runs the state basically um, in tandem with uh, the uh, priesthood of the universities, that's not really that big of a deal, actually. And that, that tends to be what he does. He often points out, um, you know, these deep corruptions, um, you know, he might call it the deep state rather than the cathedral or, or something like that. But but ultimately, all he's really doing is sort of pointing out the power structure. And he never really goes further than that. So I understand why people are interested in Tucker Carlson. And perhaps if you, you know, some conservatives who watch a show might, you know, be able to come to ideas more like what I'm talking about here mm-hmm. through him. But ultimately, he's he's still inside that containment paradigm. Um, you can't actually work within these systems and change them from the inside because they're they're entirely controlled. So um, Tucker Carlson will never actually be allowed at Fox News to do anything that truly threatens the the regime in any way. So if, if, you know, people are looking at Tucker Carlson, like, you know, he's going to run in 2024 or something mm-hmm. and, and become president and, and, and turn things around. But, you know, why would you believe that at this point um, after what we've just seen in the last few years? It's, it's, it's empirically simply not a move that's possible. The only actual way a president could actually undo the oligarchy is basically by becoming a monarch. And we know Tucker Carlson's not going to do that. He still fundamentally believes in democracy, right? And if you if you believe in democracy, you can't undermine the oligarchy because that's an entirely controlled environment, right? The the, the oligarchy's own the only actual threat to an oligarchy is monarchical power that can simply undo all of it at once. Um, the oligarchy is completely it's it's expertise in preventing democracy from working is you know one of the most perfected machines ever developed in human history so there's simply no way that you know Tucker Carlson is going to undo it by you know appealing to enough of the masses or just becoming a normal president like Trump so that's that's sort of how i see tucker i think probably his his you know if i had to guess i would say he does actually care about americans uh to some degree, but I think he is still caught in this old um, liberal conservative paradigm. And it's one that people really need to break out of if they actually want to understand um, the structure of the government. I want to talk about the trichotomy. Uh, We'll get into that. You've, You've done, I think, two videos that I saw on it. And certainly... There was a graphic that that I absolutely loved. I, I found out in talking to you off air that not everyone loved it. But let's can you talk about the uh, trichotomy and what that is? Yeah. So the political trichotomy is one of these ideas that um, was bandied back and forth between Spandrel and Nick Land. Um, Spandrel had actually come up with it in the first place, um, and you know Land talked to him about it in their old blogs. You can still find these blogs. Um, I think Lands is called uh, xenosystems.net. And uh, basically, it's just an expansion of a left-right paradigm. And it helps explain why righties have a such hard, such difficult time cooperating. Um, basically, because the, the left is sort of unipolar. It, um, it, uh, if you view the left-right paradigm as you know, a triangle turned on its side, where all the way on the left, you have one point, and on the right, you have two points uh, you know, at the top and bottom. Uh, on the left, there's this this singularity of communism or utopianism or the unconstrained vision, however you want to put it. And then on the right, you have two types of right-wingers. Um, they're 
both Darwinian. Uh, one type is sort of uh, the ultimate anarcho-capitalist, anarcho-capitalistic libertarian right-winger who believes in, in total liberty and freedom. And then the other type of right-winger who's actually just as distant from that anarcho-capitalist as the ANCAP is from communist, uh, is the nationalist or absolutist monarchist, basically. Um, and nationalism is closer to this pole. So basically, uh, you know, nationalists and anarcho-capitalists are just as far apart from each other uh, as they are from communists. And this, this actually explains, you know, a lot of arguments you see where, you know, if you, if you take any like hardcore libertarian, you know, they'll often basically say that, you know, the, the nationalists are, are basically just like the, like, they're like right-wing socialists, basically, which isn't even entirely wrong, um, in my view. But it's also not quite accurate either to say that, you know, um, let's say the, the Nick Fuentes wing of populists is like the same as left-wing socialists, right? Economically, they look the same to libertarianism, to libertarians, but obviously they're, they're coming from totally different angles. So, Basically, there's a three-pole system of American politics, um, all pulling in different directions. And unfortunately for right-wingers, people against uh, left-wing socialism, they have a very hard time cooperating because they don't fundamentally agree on many things. And this it really has to do with authority. Um, So there's one type of right-winger who very much does not want any involuntary authority above them. And there is another type of right winger who basically believes in uh, absolutism to some extent. And what what do you mean by that? By absolutism? Uh, you, basically, the idea that there is a uh, the ultimate pole of of absolutism is there is a monarch, and the monarch is essentially um, you know almost a living deity. They are the law. Mm-hmm. There there is no opposing this monarch. It, the monarch has the absolute right to rule and make the laws. And you know basically the the people. The citizens of that monarch are, are his property, essentially. Um, so that's sort of the ultimate absolutist view. For all things CBD related, there is only one stop for you guys. That is PalomaVerdeCBD.com. Once again, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. It is owned by some friends of mine, a wonderful couple out of San Antonio, Carlos and Vanessa, extremely genuine, extremely fun to hang out and party with, I can tell you that. But really, they're truly very hard workers and they put a lot of love and special touches into this company, PalomaVerdeCBD.com. It really made me proud to have them as a sponsor. Just to list a few of their products, I'll go ahead and tell you some. They've got the Sleep Bundle Combo Pack. They've got the Mint CBD Tinctures. they got several flavors of the CBD Tinctures. And I love the cool menthol sports cream. The moment you have a sore muscle, I'm not just saying this to sell it, it was genuinely the best sports cream I've ever used before. And it's, uh, it was amazing, I love it. I'm glad to have them as a sponsor so I get this stuff. And you know who really loves them selflessly? My favorite stuff that they provide is the pet stuff. And that's because my French bulldog Lux needs this stuff, the CBD dog chews and the pet CBD tinctures. We put it on his food every morning and every evening. These dog chews are basically like dog treats for him. He used to walk around like a little old man, French bulldog, and now he's like a very young and uh, tough French bulldog. He races me around the house because of these CBD products. I'm so glad to have these guys as a sponsor. Please give them business. They're very wonderful people, like-minded individuals, and I've got a promo code for you. So if you enter B-U-C-K, that's my name, Buck, at checkout, you will get 25% off of your order over $75. That's 25% off everything over $75. Please give them a visit, palomaverdecbd.com. Enter promo code Buck, and you will be extremely happy that you paid this wonderful couple a visit and gave them some business. Let's get back to the show. Do you think that humans are wired uh, innately to to want a leader? Yes, I think humans are actually, in general, uh, looking for for leadership. Um, most people are not natural leaders. Most people are not looking to lead. They're they're looking for you know someone to help them live an orderly life. Um, and you know this is kind of the way a lot of conservatives view the world. Is you know they just want to grill as we say, and they, they sort of want the government to be competent. You know, they don't want to actually be leading the government. They just want the government to, 
you know, actually uh, govern in the interest of the populace. Uh, and that's a very natural um, state of affairs. It's, it's, it's very natural to not want to have to, uh, you know, take this leadership position in society. Um, that's sort of a, a, a strange, uh, it, it's, it's a very particular type of person who really desires to rule over other people. And most people are really not very capable of it. And of course, you see this in the corporate world. And, you know, some people have the fantasy about being a CEO, but if you actually look at what it's like to be a CEO, most people would actually not want to do it and would be much happier um, in a lower position. So I think there is a desire for some authority who, you know, is wiser to to really take the reins and, and help guide everyone in the right direction. Um, and I think this is what's often missing from libertarianism is that many libertarians are sort of seeking to be, you know, totally unaccountable to anyone, whereas people in general want to be accountable to someone responsible and for that person um, in turn to be accountable to the people in general, right? They want this this, this sort of mutually um, accountable system where the leader will do these, these high level things so that you can actually just live your life like a normal person. Um, and this is really what's missing from the libertarian worldview, I think. Mm-hmm. Do you, do you believe in, and let me ask you, I guess I'll ask you personally this, and then also how does this fit in with uh, NRX, the, the cyclical model of history? Yeah, that's an interesting question because it sort of gets into the idea of whether or not you, you know, literally believe that time is a circle or time is a line. But, you know, I could say in general, there are very clearly cycles that happen in history on a civilizational level, much like the seasons or like a person's mm-hmm. life. Uh, if you if you look at any great empire uh, in history, and you know America is a, a great empire, there's always uh, you know there's a there's a springtime um, where it's you know planting its initial seeds, and there's a summertime where the the harvest blooms, and then in the autumn it it really reaps the benefits of that, and then in the winter there's sort of this this decline and hunkering down and, and retraction. And you sort of see this pattern repeat no matter how long a civilization lasts. It, it goes through this lifespan just like a human. And, you know, sometimes there are cycles within cycles and, you know, there can be restorations. There can be a new um, a rebirth, a new empire that takes its place. And it seems to me that virtually that, that every, every civilization in history goes down this path necessarily. And I think that's something most reactionaries have come to grips with as well, that the American empire is, is probably entering its uh, winter um, mm-hmm. and the civilization is is now very stale and not very um, alive anymore. It's sort of just uh, coasting on this, this um, autumn harvest that we just got through, you know, in the, the late 20th century where uh, all of its, all of the enemies were defeated and the, the empire expanded to its, its greatest breaths. And, you know, now there's, there's just nothing, um, you know, the beating heart of the thing is just is, is somehow dead at this point. And I, everyone can kind of sense this, that, um, you know, it, it just, it doesn't feel like America is really alive anymore. Like you imagine it was in the 1950s or even before that. Um, and this is only natural. And the correct thing here is not to try and, you know, revert this process and like undo it. It's to actually figure out how to survive that winter. Is is neo reaction thought in your mind nihilistic or black pilled? And when and for my audience that's not familiar with that term, uh, pessimistic, we can say that's what black pilled is. Is it is that part of part of this philosophy to you? Some people might say that. I don't actually think it is. Um, I think it's more white pilling because understanding how the world actually is is uh, you know very white pilling. You know, some people view. Um, the idea that you really can't actually do much of anything about your government as a black pill, which is the the neo reactionary perspective. Like you know, neo reactionaries um, basically believe that uh, positive or negative political action is is pretty much doomed to failure and is actually counterproductive. And a lot of people don't like that because you know they they feel like they want to do something, mm-hmm. um, which is a natural drive, right? People naturally feel like. They need to do something to, to fix this problem, this civilizational level problem that we have right now, where, you know, everything is just 
running amok and nothing is working and the culture is just in this completely bottom level state where, you know, all of our values have been undermined and, you know, everything that the cathedral propagates is just an anathema to us. To us. And you want to change that, but the fact is uh, you don't actually have the, the power to change that, um, especially not if you view your power as a vote or as any sort of democratic power. And a lot of people uh, get very disenthused by this observation of neo-reactionaries that there's really very little you can do um, to change anything at all. Um, so I guess it's up to you if you want to decide that the, if that's a black pill. At the end of the road, you know, neo-reactionaries aren't saying that we're stuck in this forever. Mm-hmm. It's more like you're just going to have to to wait until uh, things are in a position such that they can change, right? Which the way to get to that position is really to just explain to people, uh, you know, how the, the, the government actually works. Um, and I think neo-reaction, and we've really only gotten into a little bit of it, um, offers a very good model of, of how that actually works. And only once people really understand the, the power structure of the American state um, will they be willing to take the necessary steps to actually do anything about it. In the meantime, if you're trying to oppose the government, which is a very, very, very stable government, um, all you're doing is sort of feeding it energy, right? Because ultimately all power flows through it. And, and the United States is actually a very stable government. You know, it's not like the Soviet Union in the 1980s. You know, it's more like the Soviet Union in the 1950s, right? I mean, there's there's nothing inside the American state that even remotely threatens it as a competing power center, right? All, all of the American empire's power is consolidated in this one unified oligarchy that's a merger of uh, corporations and then state and you know until people fully take on board that the democratic system of politics is all just this virtual show basically as entertainment right politics is just there to entertain really to give the masses something to do to distract them from the reality of the oligarchy um as long as as people still see that as the real government then there's really nothing to be done so um, and, and why is this is, is because, you know, take a look at the uh, example of, you know, Nick Fuentes or the alt-right, as you mentioned, like mm-hmm. the, the regime's legitimacy is is based on this idea that there are evil fascists running around and they're going to somehow <laughs> instantiate a fascist coup or something, right, which is completely ridiculous. The regime depends on this, though, to legitimize itself because in its in its own rationalizations for its power – it's telling you that, you know, there are these evil, you know, racist, sexists, fascist people that threaten, you know, all of us and we have to, you know, do something about it. Well, if you're going to be the person who's basically going to fill those shoes for the regime, then you're, you're giving it the heel, you're giving it the bad guy that actually justifies its existence. So if you, if you want the regime to become less stable to the point where um, it can actually be altered in, in some uh, fundamental way. You actually have to just disengage from it, right? You actually have to stop feeding it this political energy because it it loves that energy. It loves to, uh, you know, pick a fight. Um, people often think that when the regime lashes out at them that they've actually accomplished something or done something. You know, like, you know, if they, if they ban Nick Fuentes from Twitter, which I think has happened before, but just happened mm-hmm. again today, I think, or they ban Trump from Twitter, right? Oh, they must be afraid. But you have to think of it more like um, you have to remember that this is a religion, right? And when you when you say something that's an affront to the you know holy pronouncements of the Democratic Party, you're like scratching their precious statue or something, right? And just like any zealot, they're going to come down on you really hard and persecute you really just for the fun of it. I mean, it's a lot of fun to to persecute your uh, your religious enemies. I mean, they just, they enjoy it. They like doing it. It justifies their own power in their heads. So it's actually a very important part of their political formula. So again, you must simply disengage from this process and, and take away that energy that the very participation in the process gives it. And only at that point can the regime actually be altered. And people view this as a black pill because, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm saying here, participation in politics 
no matter which side you're coming from, it only makes the regime more stable, more strong, more powerful. Um, and you know, people don't like to hear that. I think it's uh, I think it's a white pill because you realize that there's this whole sideshow of politics that's just a waste of your time. And actually, you can the best thing you can do is just not participate in it. You know, I think that's that's actually a very liberating experience when you see all these fights between conservatives like you know DeSantis and and Green and these other people and Congress going on. You realize, oh, this is all just just nonsense, right? Whatever Trump is doing now, that's also just it's just nonsense. It's all just part of this game that's that's played in front of me to distract me, and I can just ignore it, you know. And as long as you don't, uh, you know, as long as you're not antagonizing the regime, uh, you're about as safe as you can be. Um, if you're going to participate in politics, that makes things much more unsafe for you, as people have found. So I, again, I think that's a white pill: is learning how to get along in this this crazy regime in the safest way possible. Um, I want to talk about formalism because that's that's another term we come across studying Mencius Moldbug's writings and, and you've done some work on it as well. What can you explain how that term fits in and what it means within the NRX movement? Yeah, so formalism is basically this idea that for the purposes of accountability, the actual holders of property ought to be the on paper legitimate owners of the property. And this solves conflict. Basically, formalism views conflict and violence as disputes over, you know, property ownership, which is very basically how, you know, Mises or any libertarian would, would view conflict as well. And in the formalist perspective, this is really focused on, on power. Um, so, you know, as I said, the uh, the cathedral, which is the media plus journalists or the actual holders of power in the United States, they actually decide um, the principles upon which the state is going to operate and all of the bureaucrats and the oligarchy um, instantiate these ideas. So the formalist uh, would say that, okay, well, these guys should just actually have power on paper, right? So instead of having a constitution that divides the branches into these three governments, um, let's just scrap all that and say, okay, the the uh, the universities and the media, mm -hmm. they are the uh, imperial priestly caste. They are accountable and responsible for all decisions that happen in the American empire. And all of this Congress and president and Supreme Court stuff um, – None of that's real because they don't actually hold the power. So let's let's formally make these people the actual rulers of the country, which doesn't actually change anything, right? It's not to say that it's good for them to be the rulers. It's just the recognition that they are actually the rulers. And actually, it would be better to recognize that because then when when things go wrong, you won't, you know, blame Joe Biden or something, right? Because as if Joe Biden is actually responsible for anything, you can actually blame the people who are truly responsible for it. And this is sort of the first step towards solving your problems, because once you actually understand who is responsible uh, for things and can hold them accountable, well, that's that's basically how you ensure the government acts in your interest in some way, right? Is to be able to hold them accountable. But as long as we're playing this game of, informal power structures, which is what the cathedral has, the, the media has informal power, um, you can't actually do anything about it um, because there's there's nothing to say that they're responsible to anyone. And if, and if you're not responsible, you can't be held accountable. It, it almost seems like I, I, I could see why someone would say this, this philosophy is a black pilling philosophy because it's kind of taking a sobering realistic look at what really is going on and, and kind of taking the scales off of people's eyes. Uh, but I, but like you, I, I see that as kind of white pilled because you're helping people see things for what they truly are rather than just have this cloud of this, you know, story we're told in, in elementary school about how government works. Do you see that as well? Yeah, I agree. I mean, to me, removing the scales from your eyes of your, you know, state indoctrination program that you've been through your entire life is uh, really liberating. And the particular conclusions don't really matter that much. I mean, finding the truth itself is is really white pilling, I think. And mm -hmm. whether or not materially those conclusions might be disappointing to you, well, ultimately, I'd rather just, just actually understand the world than 
be in this position where, you know, I feel like I can do something, but actually can't. I mean, to me, that's, that's the, the biggest black pill is like, if you're someone still participating in like populist politics or something, you're, you're just running on a treadmill and you're never going to get anywhere and you're going to get disappointed. Right. To me, that's the black pill is, is, is doing something over and over again. That's never going to work. And I, I think empirically at this point, um, the Trump presidency has, has basically confirmed all of this for us um, that politics as such, democracy as such, is, is simply not a means by which the oligarchy can be confronted. The only way to actually confront the oligarchy is with monarchical power, which, you know, we've had in the U.S. before. This is, you know, um, Abraham Lincoln. It's FDR. You FDR, know, monarchical right. presidents, um, true executives are not anything new in the United States. There's just uh, not really been a, a, a what you would call a right wing uh chief executive in a very, very long mm-hmm. time. Do you, that's, it's funny you say that's, that that seems to be what the cathedral pretended Trump was, although yes. we've seen that it's not the case. Do you see it, a possibility of a right-wing, mon, excuse me, monarchical figure taking the presidency? In the near future, it's, it's difficult to imagine this happening. Um, there, I, I think there's a decent chance that it will happen in the future at some point, uh, but it's hard to make predictions, sure. you know, things could go any number of ways. Um, in terms of, I guess people can decide for themselves how likely this is, but in terms of what this would actually look like, you know, uh, basically you would have, you. this is the one case where you would actually use democracy. So how do you get rid of the oligarchy is you actually use democracy to elect a monarch. Um, and, you know, and actually monarchs um, historically um, after the Roman Empire basically were actually elected. Um, they were elected by the aristocrats, but you know, they weren't these absolutist hereditary monarchs in many cases. Um, so it's not at all odd to elect a monarch um, through some sort of democratic means. And how this would happen is, well, the the candidate would, would basically say what they're going to do, right? Um, so imagine if you had a presidential candidate running who basically said, um, you know, something along what Trump did, but more specific. I mean, I'm talking about, you know, elect me president and, you know, I am going to um, dissolve the State Department on day one and reintegrate all those responsibilities into the president of the United States. Also, I'm going to dissolve the Department of Agriculture. Also, I'm going to dissolve the Department of uh, Education. And uh, this is simply going to happen. Um, All of these uh, regulations the legislature has placed uh, are unconstitutional, I'm now the living constitution, actually, because we already have a living constitution, right? This is a kind of cute thing from from Yarvin is that, you know, the, the president can just declare himself the living constitution. And, you know, if, the, if you actually run on this platform, people can choose to vote for it or not. And if people choose to vote for a monarch, well, there's your popular mandate. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you just fire the bureaucrats, right? I mean, the, one of the problems conservatives have is that they want to they want to retake these institutions. Yeah. Right, which kind of doesn't make any sense, actually. I think the critical race theory thing that's happening right now is a really good example of how absurd this sounds, right? Where we have this problem basically where you know the schools are poisoning your children's minds with this this thing we call critical race theory. Um, so what you want to do is you know, <laughs> you want to reform that so you can continue sending your children to the these places that are poisoning them, right? I mean, that doesn't make any sense, right? If you find out that, um, you know, the school lunches are, have, have poison in them on purpose, are you going to be like, you know, oh, we need to reform this or, right. oh, we just need to get rid of this, right? Mm-hmm. What you actually would want to do as, as a right winger is you don't want to take over the State Department. You just want to, you don't want to take over the government at all, really. You just want to restructure it, Right. And you, you, to do a restructuring, you know, often you see this in corporate takeovers is you just fire everyone. You just fire all of the bureaucrats and put a new structure in place. And that's the simplest way to do it. And uh, you don't even have to persecute anyone, right? I mean, this is, there's kind of this uh, weird thing in Germany, right, where, where Stasi officers have pensions. Um, mm-hmm. That's actually entirely normal, right? You, you never want to persecute anyone in the current regime merely for being loyal to it, right? So you take all these professors from Harvard, all these journalists, the New York Times, et cetera, you give them a nice stipend and say, okay, you know what? Here's a lot of money. Um, you're now fired, but here's your, your stipend, your pension. Go live on vacation island. You're never allowed to, to participate in politics again. Um, that's your, your only um, 
restrictions. Other than that, uh, go have a nice life, basically. And, you know, how many, if you take the budget of the State Department, you just distribute it mm-hmm. amongst all of the people employed there and then just fire them. How many bureaucrats are going to keep working just because they really like being bureaucrats, right? I mean, they're just going to leave. And this this is really what a an actual uh, restructuring looks like, is, is you kind of just have to come out with a clean slate Mm-hmm. And just start from the start from square one. And this is entirely doable within the U.S. system through constitutional means, as other presidents have uh, done in the past. Um, you know, it, it might sound crazy. Um, but again, you asked how likely is this? Well, I guess uh, we'll leave it to the audience to decide how uh, likely they think something like that actually is. But, um, you know, I think it's there's probably a greater chance of it happening than most people would, would think. Well, what do you find most valuable from uh, learning and, and reading and understanding neo-reactionary thought? Probably the greatest value I've gotten from it is uh, all of these deep historical references um, that I didn't even know existed. All of these things I was never told about in um, you know, the public schooling system or, or universities. I mean, if you read one blog from, from Curtis Yarbrough, mm-hmm. yeah. there are so many references in there to all of these uh, authors and works and just completely random books you've never heard of. And you can just go pick up any one of them and, you know, come across all sorts of new ideas that will just blow your mind. So I think the, the biggest uh, benefit of neo-reaction when you're learning it is it's kind of you're, you're forced to even understand it, to go read all of these uh, uh, books that uh, are basically uh, obscured from you on purpose. And you, you sort of, force yourself to get a to proper uh, education on, on history and political science. And, you know, this is something I'm, I'm still pursuing um, is, uh, you know, really getting a, a deep education on, on history. And there are a lot of people uh, in our scene who are, are, are helping out with that. Well, let's talk about books before we get you out of here. Give some of my listeners uh, recommendations on, and I guess not just books, because we all know that Yarvin's stuff is really blog based. So, reading material that you think people should look into? Ah, okay. Um, well, Carlyle, Thomas Carlyle, is one of the authors that Moldbug cites uh, most frequently. Um, honestly, if I had to recommend anything, it would, it would be probably Libertarian or, you know, Burnham. I mean, just read Hans Hermann Hoppe. I would say that's, that's really the number one book. Uh, just read Democracy, the God that Failed. If you read that, that is a huge step in the right direction. Um, read Mises, um, even a little bit of Mises. Read Rothbard. Um, these will really uh, – one, one, of, one of the things I like about Austrian economics is it's a very much a living uh, tradition, and it's extremely logical. So this will sort of get you thinking in the right way. Um and let's see, numbers two and three after Democracy, the God That Failed, I would say, are The Managerial Revolution by James Burnham and The Machiavellians, Defenders of Liberty by James Burnham. Um, those are three key books. The second two are fairly long. You can find them in audiobook format. Um, let's see, I can recommend a few side interests, I suppose. So there's this yeah. publishing company that I really like. Uh, you may have seen them on Twitter. They're called Mystery Grove. Um, one of the books they've published recently are the memoirs of uh, General Wrangel, who was the white Russian uh, leader, political and military leader at the end of the Russian Civil War. And I think um, Americans would benefit greatly uh, from learning about the Russian Civil War, uh, especially from his perspective. That's called uh, Always with Honor. Um, the Russian Civil War is sort of this part of history that Americans aren't really taught about, mm-hmm. um, and it's very relevant to what's happening now. Um, let's see, what else? Um, just looking at my bookshelf here. Oh, um, yeah, Thomas Sowell. Um, mm-hmm. I haven't read any Sowell myself, but uh, he often comes recommended in our circles. So that's an off- author you could look into. Um, right now I'm reading an interesting book. If audience members are interested in, um, World War II called Mm -hmm. Stalin's War. Um, this is a very interesting book and 
It's sort of a, a revisionist history mm-hmm. that uh, really takes Joseph Stalin as sort of the center figure of uh, World War II. And it actually gets into some of the interesting details of how much the Soviets actually infiltrated the United States and British governments at the highest levels um, and were influencing their foreign policy. And this is very much related to some of the things you encounter in um, reactionary circles is this sort of recognition that the center of world communism was actually the United States. Um, And it really provided a lot of the ideological uh, justification for the Soviet Union and was eventually infiltrated by the Soviets uh, in a very complete manner. James Burnham himself has another book on this subject called The Web of Subversion, um, which is quite good. So it's it's, uh, very useful to understand the depths in which the communists literally infiltrated and basically took over um, the U.S. bureaucratic apparatus um, following FDR. Um, let's see, The Fourth Turning. That's, yes. a, that's an interesting book. That, Yeah, that's, um, if you're interested in cyclic history, which we discussed, uh, The Fourth yeah. Turning is, is relevant, uh, relatively recent. Um, it basically discusses generational theory in like a formal sense. Um, so, and just one more, I guess, if you really want to get esoteric, you could always check out uh, something like Revolt Against the Modern World by Julius yes. Evola. I find this really interesting because Evola is sort of like the ultimate reactionary. I mean, he's coming he's coming from so far outside of the perspective of the modern person that it's sort of mind-blowing. Yeah. Um, with that book, you might want to – I would say it's – Reading Evola, you you definitely want to have a decent understanding of uh, European history um, if you really want to to understand um, his uh, especially revolt against the modern world completely. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I think that should be a good good list of things for people to start with of, of various scopes and sizes. Yeah, you, it sounds like you almost read my bookshelf, but this you, <laughs> you, you you dropped some new ones on me too, so I appreciate this. What a list of books this is. Uh, Plug away, plug your, how, however someone should find you, go ahead and tell them. Yes, yeah, so you could find me on YouTube if you search, uh, you know, Mencius Moldbug, Charlemagne should bring up my channel. Channel's just called Charlemagne. I have a, a series called Mulling Over Moldbug, which I made three or four years ago, which sort of goes through in more detail the ideas we talked about today. Um I'm also on Twitter. My current handle, handle number three, is Charles Main Two. Um, I've tried uh, Fed posting a lot less on that one to avoid the ban hammer. Uh, very much in the uh, neo reactionary tradition, you know, don't antagonize the uh, ruling elite. Uh, let's see. I have a Telegram chat. I can post that on my Twitter as well. I'm on Odyssey. That's very important. People should be getting on Odyssey. Uh, I'm, I'm Charlemagne on Odyssey. Uh, shouldn't be too hard to find me there. I have backed up my key videos on Odyssey. So if you search Smart. for, you know, mulling over mold bug on Odyssey, you should find my channel. Um, I have a gab as well. Um, I don't really use it these days. Honestly, I'm, I've am i kind of settled on, you know, Twitter is where the action is. Yeah. Um, but if you search for Charlemagne on Gab, you should be able to find me there as well. And finally, of course, BitChute. Um, I'm pretty disenchanted with BitChute, honestly. But once again, if you search for my videos on BitChute, you should find them. But Odyssey is really going to be mm-hmm. uh, my main platform going forward with some things. I mean, I actually have an exclusive on Odyssey right now. And, you know, I find it really liberating to be able to uh, make fair use of content and not have to suffer the band hammer. Because yes. on YouTube, you can't even do certain things, uh, play video clips in your videos without getting a strike on your channel. And this, this is just really irritating. Um, so yeah, Odyssey. All right, awesome, man. Thanks so much for uh, ex- doing this interview and, and uh, enlightening some of my listeners as to the NRX philosophy. And I know there's a lot of them that were familiar with it. And I hope you guys uh, found this entertaining as well. Charlemagne, thank you so much, man. Thanks for having me. Yes, sir. All right. So I'm going to link to all of his stuff in the show notes page. Like I said, go to his YouTube page. Just type in maybe Charlemagne mulling over mold bug or Charlemagne mold bug. You'll find his page, subscribe to it and watch some of this content. You will learn some things. I can promise you that his Twitter. Of course, I will link to, like he said, it was his third account 
And I was following the last one and it got nuked, but I'm back on following this one. He's got a Telegram group like I do. I'm going to have to uh, join that group. That's going to be good. So I'll link to all of that. And since I'm talking about the Telegram group, might as well join ours, right? If you've got that app, Counterflow with Buck Johnson. Follow me on Twitter at Buck Rebel, B-U-C-K-R-E-B-E-L. The website's going strong. You guys have ordered just about all of the shirts from Death to Tyrants. The clearance sale, the $10. There's one double XL shirt left. That's it. Other than that, we've got Counterflow podcast shirts. Really, really nice looking ones. And what else? The YouTube page is going strong. I'm getting new subscribers all the time. I forsaked it for quite some time. And now we've got it up and running. We've got videos of every interview I do. You will not see my guest today, Charlemagne's face. However, you will see a beautiful looking avatar on there. And then my face as well. My apologies for that. But yeah, go check it out. We will be doing live streams as well with all kinds of guests. So I think that's about it, you guys. Thank you so much for being here on Counterflow. And wait till next week's guest. Wait till you see who I got next week. It will be big. Take it easy. Have a good one. You get split in fucking half. Cause I call him the hologram brass. But I am the center inside the placenta of math. You clash with cyanide gas and die fast. Rhythmical equivalent of solids, liquid, and gas. We smash your science with the power of Lord Titus. But I am the virus inside of the iris of Cyrus. Like the sound of the Counterflow podcast? Our audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com. This has been the Counterflow Podcast, a part of the Renegade Media Network.